Welcome to this webcast. I am Dr. Bradley Greenalsh, and I am the student coordinator in the Dean's Office of the Faculty of Law here at Stenobos University. I did both my LLB and my doctorate in law at the faculty, and my particular interests lie in collective labor law, specifically trade unions, as well as law and technology. In this presentation, we are going to be talking today about what you can do with your law degree once you have actually graduated. And in this sense, I just want to make one or two initial observations. This is going to be a little bit different to the other webcasts that you have seen. This one is going to have far more images than any of the others. And I'm also going to try something a little bit different in the sense that I'm going to pretend that this lecture hall is not empty, but that it is filled with all of you eager prospective students, as well as your parents and the occasional older or younger sibling that's a bit bored because they had to come along because they weren't allowed to be left at home. So I hope that you will enjoy this session and walk along with me as I try and explain what your future could involve. Now, with that being said, we are going to be looking at those future plans. We are going to be looking at what the thinking of a jurist might entail, as well as, obviously, career options. Now, some of these aspects have been touched on in the other webcasts, but I'm going to go into a bit more detail. And I hope that in this webcast, you're also going to be sharing it with your parents, your guardians, people you trust, so that they can also get an overview of where we are going to be going to. So without further ado, your future. Those are scales, and the scales of justice are very important in the context of law. It measures the weighing up of parties' interests, of the applicants, of the respondents, and in the same way, it is a useful analogy for what you are going to be having to do. You are going to have to consider what your options are, and you're going to have to weigh these up against the background of all sorts of different decisions. And eventually, you are going to reach this point where you are graduating as a student from this faculty and this university. Now, certain things are going to be foremost in your mind. And usually, and unfortunately, it's most likely also going to involve money and a forwards movement and upwards movement because you want to be able to know that you have received a return on your investment, the time that you have put in during the course of your degree. You want to see something come back from all of that effort. And so do these people. So this is not you. This is hopefully a representation of your parents or your guardians and all the efforts and sacrifices that they have put in to be able to ensure that you have the choice and the option of coming to this wonderful faculty. And they're also going to be thinking forward. And if we can put our tongues firmly in our cheeks, maybe they're going to be interested in this element, that they want to see that you are going to offer a return on their investment in you. Now, we don't want to talk about money, but I think it's to be accepted that there are degree programs out there that people on the street, a lot of people around us, people in this country, associate with financial reward. And I think it's fair to say that law would certainly be one of them. And in this sense, one of the annual surveys that are conducted in South Africa by New World Wealth, uh, and the most recent one then being the South African Wealth Report of 2020, it identified certain key aspects, including that in South Africa, there are approximately 38,400 high net worth individuals. These are people who are worth in excess of a million US dollars, and there are plus minus 2,300 multimillionaires in South Africa. Now, what does this mean? Well, as summarized by Business Insider, almost 30% of South Africa's super rich studied law. That was their background. And this statistic is fairly unchanged over the last several years. And if we were to break that down, we would see here that the type of degree or the area of study as a percentage of the high net worth individuals, law is always comfortably at the top, sitting at 27%. And if you then work down that list, you see what you might expect, finance, accounting, 19 and 20%. And then you see a host of other pr professions or areas of study there at the bottom. Now, I want to make the following point though. You are obviously not guaranteed of riches and wealth merely by virtue of the fact that you choose law as a background. You can see very significant degree programs that are also on this list that would suggest that those individuals, whilst earning comfortable livings, 
are not necessarily converting that to the point where they will make massive amounts of money. What this teaches us or shows us is that you as a graduate of a law degree have options. You can either enter the traditional field as anyone would and do a nine to five job in office hours. Granted as a, a law graduate, you might work a little bit longer hours than others, but you could earn a fixed salary or you could utilize that knowledge, the skill that you have acquired, should you be open to it, to convert that into something else, into an entrepreneurial aspect to then eventually have money, make money for you. So I'm going to leave this point here and say that that's just something to consider. But the bottom line is, where are you in all of this? And, and where do you see yourself going? Somewhere around the lady of justice there is you and where you're going to be in seven, eight years, depending on what grade of, of school you're at now and what you hold. If anything, it is the proverbial fork in the road. But there are going to be many of these, because I think we all need to acknowledge that careers have also changed. Our parents, for instance, were more prone to working at one particular job after they left university, if they went that route, and very often would stay in that particular job or in that particular company or business for a very long time. Increasingly, however, in today's market and today's professional environment, that is not necessarily the case. Young people move around and gain different experiences at different jobs and change regularly, sometimes as regularly as every two to three years, sometimes a little bit longer. Of course, you can do either, but the point is you are going to be coming across many of these proverbial forks in your career choices, and this is something that I would like to touch on over the course of the next few minutes. Now, I said earlier that we're also going to be touching on thinking, the thinking of a jurist, what it means to think like a jurist. Now, as a law student, one of the aspects that we focus on is the development of critical thinking. You would have seen that skill being highlighted in all of the various degree programs in the different webcasts, and it remains imminently true. What is going to set you apart from so many other degree programs is how you think how you engage with information, how you see information. Now, that doesn't happen overnight. And sadly, in some instances, that transformation never properly happens with our law students. But if you are open to it and you absorb what we are trying to convey to you and you are looking for that development, then yes, it happens and it happens here. You are a sponge when you come into this uh, faculty. Your brain is just soaking up information and that conversion can take place over the course of your studies. Because what you want to get to eventually is when you progress past what you might have known in terms of entering that law faculty and the route that you're going to end up on. Now, I don't particularly support this poster, but that was the closest I could get to in terms of trying to demonstrate uh, my point, because we don't want to stand here and define what stupid means. What, what we want to focus on is this that you eventually get to the point where you can think outside the box. What you put into yourself, what you are exposed to as a law student is one of the core aspects of what sets you apart if you are open to it. Now, the bottom line is that you need to formulate those connections. And while you are being exposed to these different skills, you must also realize that eventually what you do particularly well will not be particularly out of the ordinary to you because you would become acclimatized to it. And all your fellow law students are going to be thinking in the same way. The key though, is that what you are doing in terms of your mental paradigm is different to other graduate programs. You've got to remember that and capitalize on that when you're going forward. And why is thinking so important? Well, one of the aspects is this, whether we like to admit it or not, artificial intelligence, AI, the internet of things, the computational aspects of law, blockchain, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, the mechanization and deep learning, deep thinking of data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, data sciences, it is coming. And in many instances, it is already here. A large part of what you potentially do as a knowledge worker, which is after all what we all are these days, can in certain instances, increasingly be replaced by algorithms. Now, if that is the case, what is going to set you apart? What are you able to bring to the table that cannot be replicated by a computer or AI thinking? 
that again is where you have the opportunity here as a law student to branch out into so many fields. If you can conceive it, you potentially can do it. Now, when we start looking at these particular career options, allow me to start off with what I think would be expected as one of the traditional ones, that of the attorney. Now, there's no two ways about it. There are very many different attorney professions or attorney firms or attorney companies that you can get involved in of all shapes and sizes. Most people seem to associate attorneys with very large corporate uh, firms, but that's certainly not the case. Many towns and, and villages and even cities around South Africa and in the world, you will find small boutique law firms that do everyday law and fulfill a very important role in the context of the functioning of this country. And yet, that association holds true. Many people associate attorneys with the court system. Over here, we've got the constitutional court at the top. The bottom left, the Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein, and then a typical high court. But one distinction to keep in mind is that the majority of work done by attorneys, were they to appear in court, would normally happen at the lower courts. Uh, but we'll discuss that a little bit later. But in essence, this is what people associate with our attorneys. Now, there is a flip side to that. There is the state work, state attorneys, and the role to fulfill within the public office. This picture that I just turned to look at, forgetting that it's on your screen, is a photograph that was taken several years ago of a local magistrate's court. I believe this was done in Somerset West. And there, uh, this photo was taken after they had reorganized the shelving in uh, the magistrate's court. And that is a particularly neat and tidy uh, set of files. But I want to raise this point. Yes, you are going to have to get very acclimatized to doing a lot of reading because paperwork forms the core of what you do as a, as a law student and as a law graduate. But there is always a human element to engage in with the law that is all too often forgotten. Every single one of those files is a case. There are people associated with it. There are stories. When you go to court, when you go to trial, you are holding the dreams and aspirations in the hands of individuals and their extended families in many circumstances and many of those examples. Family members and children, the elderly, the disabled, all sorts. So please don't lose sight of that fact as well. Law and the study of law is a very human aspect of the social sciences. You will be engaging with people across the board from all walks of, walks of life in many of the things that you end up doing. What about the other side of that, that of the advocates? Again, there's sort of associations made with this, um, regulated in South Africa by the Legal Practice Council as our attorneys, and there's another picture of the National Bar Council of South Africa. Fortunately, we don't wear wigs anymore, but advocates are also, first and foremost, the ones that you see in the news because they are standing up often in front of the constitutional courts or the supreme court or the high courts and arguing those cases they are the litigators although obviously that's not all they also write opinions and that is an, an opinion let me just interrupt myself there is is basically providing an a, a, an opinion a reasoning on what an outcome of a particular matter could be or what the particular um, decision should be what the situation is what the applicable rules are in a given legal problem, because advocates are very often specialized in particular areas. They could be asked by attorneys to give advice in that regard. But I just wanted to make the point though, that this is frequently what we focus on when we think about advocates and attorneys, but the legal profession is incredibly varied and is very wide. There is honestly scope for any of you to find a place within this field. You do not have to be a brilliant public speaker. You do not necessarily have to be incredibly comfortable in front of other people. That can develop over time, but it is not essential. You don't have to stand up in court and litigate. You can do much with a law degree that never involves you having to argue per se. You will argue with the mind. You will argue with the pen. You will argue with your computer, the keyboard, the written word, so to speak. So never lose sight of that fact either. And of course, as we hinted at at the beginning of this discussion, there is also the role of the entrepreneur. And I'm not going to stand too still on this anymore. You just have to look around you and in many instances without realizing it, 
there are so many successful people in this country and worldwide that have law as a background because they are comfortable with uncertainty. They are comfortable in living between the black and the white, the clear and the less clear. That is the world that they move around in. It allows them to think strategically. It allows them to see opportunities that many other graduates might not see and to then do something about it. Again, if you are open to exposure in your way of thinking and your way of being at the time that you are studying law with us. And what else? Now, passion. Many of you join us because you are incredibly passionate as, as prospective law students. You want to change the world, and that is fantastic. You want to do it bit by bit or make major changes. And yes, there is no two ways about it. Law is the vehicle in most instances where that type of lobbying can translate into actual legislation, actual laws that can make a meaningful difference to the lives of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions of people. In our own context, our legal clinic, our law clinic, that is very much part of this faculty, has taken on major class action uh, procedures, actions, and applications that has changed laws applicable to thousands and hundreds of thousands in this country. This is the place where passion can meet the proverbial tar, and you can make the difference in that sense. But how do you put your hand up? What are you thinking about in terms of ensuring that you can have these options available to you so that you don't end up in the proverbial one way? Well, again, we are speaking of that proverbial fork because there are so many different career options available. These are just the ones that I could think of and could put up on uh, the presentation slide myself, but they are countless. You do not necessarily have to go into the traditional legal fields if you choose not to. Again, the sky is the limit depending on what you are able to think about and where your interests lie. Now, with that being said, I don't want you to think that I've been focusing purely on the commercial or on the money-making side of things. Far from it. It goes without saying that there is incredibly important work to be done by student activists, you prospective students that see something in the world that you feel is unjust and you want to make a change. In. You can fulfill that obligation by going to parliament and, and helping to draft legislation or becoming a politician and trying to get it done yourself. The roles of NGOs, non-governmental organizations and everything that they are doing in that context to make changes to environmental laws, to assist people who do not have a voice and even the United Nations and various international bodies or NGOs to make a difference to food security and water rights. Your interests can dictate where you want to eventually end up. So too with all of these different NGOs, here are about a handful of them that are all driven with their backbone, firmly entrenched in the law and students, graduates working at these NGOs to try and make a very real difference. And of course, if you do work for those NGOs, very often you might end up here again at the Constitutional Court, in this case, Chief Justice Mukheng Mukheng, making your arguments, trying to make a very real, tangible difference to the world out there. Now, as we start closing off, I want to just make mention of what about postgraduate options? It goes without saying that once you've studied and, and completed your undergraduate degree, if you wanted to do further specialization, you could enroll in an LLM or an LLD and eventually uh, move into the field of academics where you can teach fellow law students, new law students about the law and about how they can take on the world. Alternatively, of course, you would have seen in the other video class that there was reference to honors programs in some of our other faculties to go into that specialization too. Should you be interested in studying further, however, uh, there are many opportunities through our faculties interaction with our partner universities where you can then go and study abroad as well. And here's but a small sample of some of the prominent universities that we are involved with, both in Africa and in Europe. And then we are frequently asked at our open days, what about international careers? What are our options there? Now, I don't want to pause too long on this point, but I just want to make a simple a statement that to be able to go and use your law degree overseas, the same rules and procedures would apply towards you as a graduate from South Africa in law, as would apply to any graduate in law from Germany, from anywhere in Europe, from the UK, from America. In America, for instance, a, a person who graduates from a law school in New York would have to go through a procedure if they wanted to practice law in California, as an example. 
Why? Because the legal systems in those different jurisdictions are simply different. The way that law works, the way that you think about the law, the way that you engage with the material in most instances is similar, and that would help you, but you still need to become familiar with the individual laws that apply in those different countries. So to answer that question about can I use my law degree overseas, yes. The extent to which you can do it is going to be dependent on you and which country you might be interested in going to, and you would then need to comply with the various requirements in that particular country. But there is no reason why you could not study further or serve as a consultant in one of the big law firms overseas. And I can confirm that it happens frequently. Many of the people that I studied with and students that I was involved with are now practicing very successfully in all parts of the world. I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation with me, and I think I want to finish off now with this final word, which really encapsulates everything that we've been trying to convey to you here today. That the power of the jurist lies in the uncertainty of the law. And that really is it. You are going to be exposed to a world where things might appear to be certain, but upon further investigation, they are not. And you are going to become comfortable with that. How you use that to the best of your abilities when you leave university is going to largely be up to you and how brave you feel and how confident you feel in all of these valuable skills that you would have been exposed to along with the knowledge at our faculty. But I can assure you that we are a very good faculty and we offer a very rigorous program. And when you complete a degree from Stellenbosch University's law faculty, you can be justifiably proud and know that you stand shoulder to shoulder with any graduate from anywhere else around the world in terms of law. I want to just remind you finally that if you require any more information, please have a look at all of these different websites. Be sure to watch our other webcasts that will provide you with more information about your law degree. Thank you for spending your time with me today. And I look forward to seeing one of you, all of you soon on campus and in this faculty. I want to thank you. Donkey in course. Goodbye.